the NFL podcast is enriching themselves in bath salts. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL podcast. My name is Dan Hansis. I come to you from a virtual room filled with some heroes. Mark Sessler, Greg Rosenthal. What's up, boys? Hey, now. Hey, buddies. Greg and I still have not figured out um, the machinations of how to open mm. the show off your intro minus Wes. <laughs> I mean, I just lean on Greg to say something at this point. I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I could talk about your beautiful Christmas present you're wearing, Mark. A nice uh, Star Trek, Star Wars shirt. Whoa, I am Ouch. getting in trouble there. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you were beautiful. the one who, it's a Millennium Falcon shirt. Um, got it from the family and. You were the one that famously claimed to not know what the Millennium Falcon was when I had a previous Millennium Falcon shirt. So I don't. I mean, you got as close as I could expect, right there. And I don't. I don't like to like come after you with this stuff, Mark, because it's not your fault that it's such a saturated cultural force. But like, is there a separate type of Twitter where you guys could talk about the Mandalorian? <laughs> I don't, I don't think care. I've tweeted about that once, so I don't know who no, that's you what I'm guys saying. It's are. Unfair it's like, par- it's like you, Parler. But... You guys know about Parler, the new uh, social media app. It'd be like that, but for people to talk about the Mandalorian. And, and really Ma- any Star Wars stuff. The Mandalorian. <laughs> the, 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 you're not even saying it, right? It's the, like, look, um, and I oh, saw look, your Yoda's comment. Oh, a baby in, now. Let's talk n- about it. Enough. No, I saw your comment that you, um, you jumped out of Star Wars after seeing only The Phantom Menace. Can I just let you know that like, if that was all that I saw... I would never watch another minute of it. That was not only the most disappointing film from that franchise. I think it is the, one of the most disappointing films ever made, top five. So, I, I, you know. If I ever get the invite to your new house, and I understand there's some pandemic issues going on right now, I have on more than one occasion uh, laid out the, the situation. If it interests you, and I said this to Jason Zamalto as well, a, a Star Wars nerd in his own right, I would definitely sit down and watch uh, these other Star Wars that you guys are so fond of. Because I, I haven't seen them, and I, I, I do have, as someone that likes to consider myself somewhat plugged in on pop culture, although it's starting to fade as I get older, I, I want to have these context and uh, these context touchstones. And I've been making an effort of it recently. If you follow me on social media, I somehow had missed Die Hard. I, I checked I that out. I do follow you on social media. I, I checked out um, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, one of the big uh, comedy hits of the late 80s. I have some blind spots in the film world, strangely. I don't know why, just the way it was when I was a kid. And I'm trying to fill in those gaps. Mm. Uh, but sci-fi in general has always been something that I've not been into. And that's, I think, more than any other reason why I haven't got into your realm. Well, I don't like the genre either outside of those films. And I saw them when I was a child. I think if I saw, if all this bum rush of content came at me now, I'd ignore 98% of it. So I get where you're, where you're coming from. And you're working very hard to work on these blind spots. We're talking about Star Wars again on this show. Why are we doing hey, this? Hey, um, in other Mark Sessler news, that came down officially, Mason Rudolph will start at quarterback for Pittsburgh in week 17 against the Browns. Mike Tomlin opts uh, to sit uh, many of his key starters. It looks like they're they're not locked into their spot in the uh, in the postseason, but uh, they can't get the bye. And after a long season without a without having a natural bye week, they're going to use this for their key guys. Can't blame Tomlin. We'll get into really the flip side of that argument maybe a little bit later on the Thursday show when we preview all the week seventeen. But I just want to check it check the temperature of Sessler. Obviously. Uh, bitterly disappointing, the loss to the Jets uh, on Sunday. Uh, how are you nervous that Mason Rudolph is in the picture here right now with the, with the season on the line potentially? Of course. I like, mean, where's well, your P scale? Let me ask your P it's, scale. It's One, at, um, totally it, dry. Ten, soaked. Got to run home to mommy. Soaked, running home to mommy. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I. There's nothing about any of this that makes me confident. I don't want to hear about numbers and stats and analytics. This is no different than. Um, coming into this year, a team like Buffalo figuring out how can they could possibly um, slay the ghosts of New England. I mean, if you go over to the AFC North, there are a lot of parallels here, and I don't care. It's not like Big Ben has been lighting the world on fire. I'm, part of me would rather actually, um, as a Browns fan, face their entire starting lineup and get into the playoffs because you earned it. Um, I think that this is a team that's still doubted by plenty of people, and like people have already forgot the circumstances around the Jets game. Now it's just the Browns lost to the Jets, which is 
utter madness. Um, I'm not listening to a word of that, but P scale <laughs> raging, P scale raging. Okay. Um, I, I, there's no reason to be comfortable. I do think they'll be prepared, but I don't, I'm not comfortable. Mason Rudolph's P scale should be raging with Miles Garrett coming off a, a nice game coming around the corner. That's all nice, Mark. I, 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 I would feel the same way that like it, it feels weird to go against their backups and it would be especially heartbreaking if they lose to the Steelers backups, which is certainly possible. That said, I like your chances much better with Mason Rudolph out there. So ultimately, if I were you, I think that's a good thing. All right. And that's yeah, it's just a just a teaser. We'll check in on the P scale on Thursday. Maybe we'll be a little better off, but uh, I kind of doubt it. We have a, a big show today. Uh, we will have the great Peter Schrager joining us with uh, Black Monday, as it's known in the NFL. Coming up, that is the day after the regular season when the axe falls on head coaches and we could you know, we could try to uh, sing Dixie and, and pretend like something bad's not going to happen on Monday, but coaches will lose their jobs. Entire staffs will be scattered to the wind. It happens every year. We talked about it a few weeks back when I did the uh, hot, bunt, uh, hot butt tears. Uh, there's usually about five to eight openings. Right now we have three uh, officially, and there will be more to come. So Pete, who's as plugged in as anybody, is going to talk to us about what he's hearing, uh, mm. both who could be going, who could be coming, hot names on the market, all that good stuff. Uh, looking at it as a primer for Black Monday. Um, also, I like this one. This one has been percolating for a few weeks. I kind of had to like draw it out of Rosenthal because I think I think he worries about you know what happened uh, with the previous play-by-play guy. Uh, for Monday Night Football and, and a, a certain uh, attack that went down it's at never. a coach's breakfast. Uh, the play-by-play power <laughs> rankings going through uh, Greg's interpretation of the best to the worst or the worst to the best play-by-play guys. And, you know, Sessler, you want to throw Sessler. Uh, he's, he's in the dog pound. Throw him a bone, too. Mark is going to give us his own interpretation. Uh, color guys. Uh, top mm. five, ten, whatever Mark came up with, uh, and I will just um, be here to enjoy it all. Uh, but before any of that, we wrap up week 16 with a glorious edition of Monday Night Football. Off the play action. Allen hit as he throws, able to complete it. Diggs, and taillights time. Diggs is looking back, touchdown, and he stumbles into the end zone. It's a 50-yard pass play from Josh Allen for the Buffalo Bills. Oh, my goodness. Stefa, and nobody cares about your fantasy team, but I will tell a real quick story here. 40-point lead last night I had in my championship league. My opponent has Stefan Diggs. He gets 39 points before they sit him for the balance of the fourth quarter. As close as you can come to one of the great Monday Night Collapses in a fantasy championship. Thank you, Sean McDermott. You are a special man. Stefan Diggs, three touchdowns. Josh Allen, four touchdown throws. Uh, Again, the Bills raging out of control. 38-9 over the Patriots in Foxborough. In Foxborough, it is the changing of the guard. There is no question anymore, Greg Rosenthal. Not that there was entering this game, but it, it did feel like a coronation. The the Patriots now a losing record for the first time in 20 years. First time they get swept by a division opponent in 20 years. It's all a new world now and one that uh, Pats fans like you are not too familiar with. No, it's it's reminiscent of uh, the early 90s or late late 80s uh, because that was when the the Bills were great too. Uh, You know, once we got into the 90s, this offense and Josh Allen. You can't say enough that right now they're playing better than any team in the NFL. I don't I don't think that's I mean it's almost too obvious to say in terms of consistently doing it week to week that Josh Allen has had a, a better December I would say than Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes. Now that's just December. Allen uh, had I think too many off weeks in the middle of the season to be uh, the MVP, but he would be my QB3 for the year after those two, which is amazing and some of the throws that he makes where he has to place the ball above the linebacker but in front of the safety or cornerback are just amazing 
um, to see him with that sort of touch and accuracy while he also is using his arm strength on those throws. The, the reason Diggs had such a big day partly was because he's not going to get man coverage many weeks, but this this time he did against J.C. Jackson, who's you know one of the best cornerbacks in the league. But there's no one that can cover a perfect throw from Josh Allen and a perfect uh, you know route from Diggs. And then you combine that with a defense in Buffalo that is sixth in DVOA since week eight. So that is the the biggest change, and it's why they should be viewed as you know the top Super Bowl contender behind the Chiefs. And if they were in the NFC, I might say they're the favorites in the NFC. That's how good they are. I, I'm with you. I think they could beat the Chiefs. Um, I really, I don't think that. I think that feels like an obvious thing to say that that, that there, it would be a great game. I mean, Allen, uh, his fourth appearance with 300 plus yards, four plus touchdown passes and a skyrocketing passer rating. Only Tom Brady has done that since 1950, back in 2007 in a single season. So, I mean, it's real. Um, this team is real. The, it, there's something beyond the game itself because the game was largely non-competitive. Um, the Patriots ended the game with six punts. I mean, they were they were a fizzled mess. And it to me, it was kind of like, and I'm not equating it historically, but from a football angle, like watching the Berlin Wall come down um, back when I was in middle school and not quite knowing what that was. And a younger fan um, might say, well, what's the big deal? The Bills are great, but it's been so long and the Patriots have been in their way for so for the entire century. I mean, it, this is changing the face of the NFL right now. Um, they were terrible house guests. I thought it was great to hear Jerry Hughes say, I've never had this feeling at Foxborough. Sean McDermott is the only Bills coach since 2000 who has not only beaten the Patriots twice in one season, but twice at all in in his coaching run in Buffalo. It's been that dominant. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's just incredible what Bills fans have gone through against this team. And Dan, you know it well as a Jets fan. There's going to come a day when they drop a bomb on this team too. And it's just we're watching the AFC change before our eyes. It's been happening all year. And last night was a beautiful exclamation point. Yeah, I thought, you know, as a Jets fan, I've said on this podcast, my favorite victory really in maybe any sport, uh, but certainly NFL is when the Jets knocked off the Patriots in the 2010 playoffs in Foxborough. And it wasn't just because it got them to the AFC title game and, 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 and all that. It was because it was in Foxborough. It was against Brady. It was against Belichick. It, and it was just that's become a house of horrors for all a- a- AFC East teams and really the AFC in general for 20 years. So to see this new reality that we're, we're living in, um, if you have been following the sport for decades, it, it is striking, even though none of this is surprising because we knew entering the season that the Patriots uh, were no longer an elite team. They just didn't have the parts and maybe they will after whatever they do, whether it's a reload or a rebuild. But in the here and now, they are not a very good team. And the Bills... I mean, it's talk about catching a team at the wrong time. It's the Patriots kind of limping to the finish line and the Bills just achieving this level right now where, you know, if they would have left in Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs, in addition to me losing my fantasy title, that's a 50 burger. Uh, so Sean McDermott actually showed restraint, but not too much restraint, Greg, because even when they were in full control of the game, I think 31-9, he's thrown an 80-yard bomb downfield that doesn't complete. <laughs> there was a sense of not that Sean McDermott has bad blood for Belichick and the Pages, but this idea like this is over, like this era of New England Patriots domination is over. This is the new reality. That was a message game. I mean, it's it's been over this season. And uh, I think they were just doing what the Patriots would have done and have done. And I think Belichick totally respects it. He went out of his way to, and, and I do, I don't think it's performative, um, but I, I think he pulls, he picks the spots to do it, to have that sort of long hug and talk with McDermott right at the end, kind of right. tell, he knows telling him, t- telling him how uh, impressed he is and everything, and like. He gets it. They're throwing deep when they're up fifty-two to seven on the Titans in the snow, <laughs> like you know, back again, you know, years and years ago, like that. That's what they do. I think they they know they're bad. The, the the Patriots are a walking example of how little the running game matters in the NFL. I, I I always think about that watching their offense. It's like everyone who talks about how important the running game is, like yeah, as a compliment, because you know who's great at running the ball this year? The Patriots. You know who has the third fewest touchdowns this year? The Patriots. Only the Jets. 
and the Giants have fewer touchdowns this year than J- like the running game just doesn't do that much for you if well, that's all you got. Especially when it's this passing game. I mean, the running right. game works. Right, but zero that's a, balance. But that's a, what I mean. Like it's actually possible they have a top five running game to have that good of a running game without a passing game, and it and doesn't matter. You're the worst offense in the league despite that. Whereas if you like flip it and you have a, a terrible running game, like you could in the Patriot, you know, you can still be great and and their defense is bad and and who knows like. They they're going to be a very a very different team next year. All these teams are, and the the Bills should get their eaten while while it's good. But there's no reason to think this Bills team in particular is uh, is going to be going anywhere. And by the way, they get to add John Smokey Brown, their best deep threat to this offense, in the playoffs. It's pretty amazing. And if I'm a Browns fan, and that's the slated matchup right now, that is not who I would want to see in the first round. Or a Ravens oh, no. fan. Uh, Bills rate like the Bills are the team you do not want to be facing if you're a wild card in the AFC. Well, they're not pulling a a Texans flop this time around. They're not losing right. whatever team they, they face. They're totally different. And to your point, the the Patriots had a 288 passing yard differential last night. Um, 288 yards differential, the worst in franchise history. They can't throw the ball. They're inept. And I'll one last little thing. When we sat with Sean McDermott at the owners meeting two years ago and you know we had a lot of we had a nice time with him and he seemed like a guy we liked we liked him he's a good coach but when we asked him about the patriots and this obstacle in the way he sounded like every other coach you know listen we get it we're gonna have to do our thing and get 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 them out of the way and i and part of me is like cool i don't i simply don't believe it will happen anytime soon and it's happened very quickly and it has to do with tom brady being out of the mix i get all that but the patriots have one of the biggest rebuilding jobs to do in the league this offseason. It's pretty crazy. I, I imagine Tom Brady's enjoying this as well. Not just because um, maybe there's bad blood, although I know, Greg, you don't think there is, but there is this whole chicken and the egg thing with Belichick and Brady, and it, this does not mean that Belichick's not the greatest coach ever, but it does not... It, I'm sure it's a little annoying to Belichick. He'd never tell you that Brady is again playing great and surging back into the playoffs while the Patriots now go into this deep abyss and rebuild in the first year that Brady is out of town. I think that's been another kind of element of this season that's been interesting to watch. Brady continuing to stay at that, you know, high end level while the Patriots crumble. He well, he's not going to be viewing it as an abyss. I'm sure that he they're going to be planning to compete next year whether they can figure out a way to do that because this is a team that i think was lucky to get the six wins seven if they can beat the jets jets might be favored in that game at this point um you know they're they're going to be looking to compete right away but but good luck with that i mean it, it's tough uh i like the moment when brady uh belichick got bad advice from upstairs on the challenge and then of course uh espn and abc cameras capture him uh, screaming at some poor bastard on the delicious. phone and then slamming it down. And then uh, there was a reporter, and you could hear in the voice uh, a fear to ask the question, but as a reporter, you had to do it. Uh, let's listen to uh, Belichick being asked about that incident on the sideline. <laughs> uh, there was a shot of you uh, throwing the phone uh, on the sideline. Humana, the humana. challenge. Um, it's so Giardi. What did you, it's our guy. I'm assuming you didn't see the, the play before the challenge, but... Uh, what went on on that play? Uh, yeah, it uh, you know obviously he made the catch. It was a good catch. Uh, maybe that yeah, Giardi actually you know he comported himself fairly well there actually. Well, I he think asked the right him. question at least. I, I yeah, did. yeah, he did. He asked the question, and a better lost seven hundred thousand on the Patriots last night. Went all in on uh, two wagers. Uh, at Bet MGM, and I just have to ask Greg. I know they're your favorite team, but you can't be reckless with money like that. You have a family. Like that was just a bad decision. That's true. That's true. Um, I was more confident. I'll just say in this Bills, you know, winning this game by a lot than any any pick I made all week in game debut. So I will tell you, I, I felt like a bad fan, kind of rooting um, for that to be correct last night. Hmm. Well, it's a better draft pick, and that, that's for sure. And I would think that. There's really no reason for Cam Newton to start Week 17, you'd think. It should be Jared Stidham against the Jets. But who knows with Belichick? You just never know the decision he's going to make. It's not going to come from any outside influence. Um, all right. So the Bills. By the way, Bills number two in the power rankings. I, I actually gave it a little bit of thought. So should I? Could I? The Chiefs kind of sleepwalking their way to the playoffs. The Bills are just not just a good team. This is a great team. 
And when you look at the Bills, the Chiefs, and I'm going to throw the Ravens in there personally, like mm. those three teams all – in the playoffs together, I, you can make a case for any of them right now, if you ask me. Yeah. It's going to be a lot Ravens of Ravens got a lot of holes there. But you're right. Uh, the Bills are actually ahead of the Chiefs in weighted DVOA. I think the Saints are, too, for, for that. Um, hmm. you know, But, but it, like weighting the, the end of the season a little heavier than the very beginning. So I don't think it's crazy. I think they're the two best teams in the league, the Bills and the Chiefs. I'd put the Ravens right there if they continue to play this Man, way. Man, you guys are I mean, that is you guys are buying into them beating some – I love the Ravens, and, man, they, they have, they've had a lot of injuries that those guys aren't coming back. That's all I'm saying. And they haven't okay. played. That's all I'm saying. We will track. And, of course, it must be said that they haven't had very good performances the last two Januaries. We're going to get to all that. We got so much uh, coverage of the playoffs coming up, both on this podcast and on NFL Network. It's going to be good. All right. That is Monday Night Football. All right. Let's now get to our special guest. And we are a big fan of this man. He is uh, the co-host of Good Morning Football, a program that I am lucky enough to have a weekly guest spot on. He is the senior national writer for FoxSports.com and GQ. And, of course, the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Out of the Blue. Do you not have Out of the Blue yet? Let's bring him on. He is the great. (laughs) Peter Schrager. What's up, Pete? What is up, guys? Thanks for having me on. I was on over the summer. I had a blast with you guys. And mm. here we are to end the season, week 17. Nothing better. And uh, not to take the show by storm here, but I got to tell you, Greg Mark, Dan is great on our show. We have the best time with him on the power ranking segment. Mm. I think we need a Sessler and a Rosenthal segment if you guys mm. are willing to get up so early in the morning next season. Listen, I mean, the answer is yes. I'll get up at any time. I, don't, I, <laughs> I won't go to sleep. I want to just do like a dramatic reading of Out of the Blue by Victor, you know, by you and Victor oh, Cruz. Nice. I actually I have it and I have like a little football library, all my football books back there. It's back there. And just like each each week, I read a couple more pages. So it's great TV. <laughs> I was going to say, just because you have the book, you, it was in the newsroom and you grabbed it. That doesn't mean that you get credit for it. You have to read it and, you know, pay for it. I too. think it was said. It was said. I know Pete Traeger from back. I think it was in, sent directly to. It was sent directly to my apartment in New York. I remember yes. this. This this quarantine, there have been some books that I like. I really want to read Lonesome Dove. Like it's this long, like epic. I mm. really at some point want to read Dune, like the original Dune. Now they're making the movie. Um, back, out, out of the blue, though, should be number one on everyone's list. I think it's it's oh, that course, good. It's a classic. Yeah. Dune, All a right. clear second. Yes. All right. So we're having Pete on because Pete is, is plugged in as anybody and now as we enter week 17 here uh it's time to take a closer look at what's happening with these job openings and we have obviously open gigs in detroit atlanta and houston and then there are some jobs that should be opening up but let's start we know we know with those three teams what are the teams that you feel very confident about will be Mm -hmm. searching for a new coach uh, effective black monday i don't I don't like doing this before Black Monday, and I know Black Monday is uh, is not a great day for a lot of coaches because it's not only the coaches, but there's like assistant coaches, and these families basically are told you're out of work now. You got to go hustle and scramble for another job. So it's I never like doing this. In re- in I think a couple of years ago, um, I didn't say it on air, but a lot of people did. They fired Chuck Pagano. They said he's going to be done in Indianapolis, and then Pagano won Week 17, kept his job for one more year, and he and Greg Smith. So like I don't like saying. Here are the things I think. Here are the three teams we know about. And then I would say, with a strong conviction, I think the Jets and Jacksonville most likely will be. And then there's always a wild card. I don't know on the Chargers right now. I really don't mm. know on the Chargers. I think Anthony Lynn has done a lot to help his case. And I think um, they like the locker room, the feeling right there. So I'd rather not go down that road. But Atlanta, Houston, Detroit, probably Jacksonville – probably the Jets. That's what I would say at the moment. And there's usually one or two others that would be coming. And again, you're right. This is not a celebration. What's going to happen to some of these guys and their staffs. But are you saying there's a chance that Gase can hold on to his job? Let's say, all right, let's just say, because the Jets are locked in now at number two. Now you've got Dan Panic. Yeah, you got me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're locked in at number two now, even if they beat the Patriots. Um, and normally, I was thinking about this last night while the Patriots are getting destroyed. Uh, since I'm not getting Trevor Lawrence, let's kill the Patriots in week yeah. 17 and go out with three straight wins. But that is like, do I trust this ownership to not put too much stock into a three-game winning streak after an 0-13 start? I don't trust them, Pete. 
should I be worried that there could be a way that they could sway Adam Gaze can sway ownership with a third straight win? I would say this. I, I know the guys in that building fairly well. They at no point in this season were tanking. They at no point wanted to lose. They've been wanting to win every single game, coaches, players, and I assume the owner, and of course the general manager, Joe Douglas. No one ever thought about the the draft pick the way that you, Dan, or some of the other Jets fans, or at least the local market that I'm in, were thinking about it. I would say this. Adam Gase can finish the season with three wins. I, I would assume that there's going to be a long conversation about his future, and I would assume that there might be some decks and chairs being removed on the deck as far as the coaching staff goes for the New York Jets. There we go. Um, I don't fire anybody. I don't do it. It's I, not in my I hear you. And I, um, I, I have a few things I want to ask you about, but you, you mentioned Lynn and I read something that made some sense to me that uh, one reporter close to the team thought they're going to look for any reason to keep him because they like him, And because this year was weird and it's like, they have Justin Herbert playing so well that there's actually kind of a thought, which I think makes some sense that you at least have to consider the fact, do you want to change his offense after uh, he plays so well? I also thought like Tom Telesco, who's, you know, in terms of drafting pro bowlers has done as well as any general manager in the league practically, but doesn't, you know, have a lot of wins. And sometimes, you know, they don't let the GM you know, fire multiple coaches and he's already fired uh, Mike McCoy there too. So like, so if they changed Lynn, it could be, I don't know, like, would you keep Telesco and change another coach and let Telesco pick again? Do you think like the chargers, especially with the stadium and knowing their ownership history, I think makes a difference to me too. Like knowing if they're an ownership, they might just lay back or if they're going to be super active, whether that would factor in, especially if they go ahead and win this game here at the end and like, feel like they have, uh, like a nice winning streak to close the season. They had a brutal loss a couple of weeks ago where they called the the audible on fourth on fourth <laughs> down and the running team was out right. there. But remember that play? And I think everyone thought Anthony Lynn might get fired then. And then, you know, I, I got folks in Los Angeles I spoke with and they said, we're not making any changes this week. Like, and that was the key thing this week. And I was pushing back with my folks that I know there. And I'm like, okay, this week, but does that mean next week? Does that mean the week after? Does that mean that he's safe for the off season? And I couldn't get a straight answer. They love Anthony Lynn. They love him. And like you said, Greg, great guy. The players love him. And the only issue, they haven't won many games. They did win a playoff game in Baltimore a couple of years ago, but then you start trying to make justifications in your head. You say, okay, well, look, Derwin James was injured before the season started. It's COVID. It's a weird deal. They have played in front of an empty stadium. They haven't even gotten a chance to open that new stadium. They really haven't even got their footprint settled. And Herbert's had such such great leaps over the last few. He's going to be offensive rookie of the year. Do you really bring in a new offensive coach? I, I'd be really interested to see what they do because there's a lot of reasons you can justify it. Now, I always get get into like the coaching stuff, and it's all right if Anthony Lynn were to be fired. Is there a line of teams looking to bring him in next year? I always think about the marketplace and the value of the coach. So if Matt Nagy was fired, I think there, there might be a, a line of teams to say, hey, bring in Matt Nagy for an interview. You know, like Mike McCarthy was fired. Teams were like, all right, let's bring him in. He didn't get the job right away, but let's bring him in. Um, of course, Adam Gase was fired by the Dolphins. Jets were like, let's hire Adam Gase. Whoops. I don't, sure. But at the time it wasn't whoops. Everyone was like, all right, there's a there's an established coach. Um Anthony, I'm not sure. And that's what I think is going through a lot of people's heads right now. I wouldn't be shocked if Anthony Lynn kept his job. I'll just say that. Mm. I, I would look at, you know, if you go beyond the NFL and kind of like what David Tepper did last year, going out and, you know, meeting Matt Rule and becoming enamored with him and signing into that kind of a contract, which, you know, for a college coach is that's a little that's unusual in the NFL. There's the Matt Campbells out there, um, Lincoln Riley. Jim Harbaugh's name has come up. Urban um, Meyer. Urban Meyer. I think of, you know, Dable Swinney and the Jaguars who are going to get Trevor Lawrence. Do you see um, college coaches having a chance to crack in this year? Or is it more, we're exploring these guys, but we're probably going to go with the old, the old NFL club. We're going to pull someone that we know and have more familiar information on. All right. The word I got this year is that college coaches might be more willing now to make the leap than ever before because of just how screwy the NCAA is, how uncertain things are, how there was such a lack of leadership across the board as far as conference. Like college football right now is the great abyss. No one knows 
what the future is, if it's ever going to get back on track, what's going on with amateurism and sports in general. And after the way the COVID situation handled, uh, was handled by a lot of these schools and conferences with no real direction, I think guys that forever have never listened might be willing to listen. And you know, I mentioned the name um, David Shaw to a source because for years we've heard David Shaw will never leave Stanford. David, the Pac-12 was was weird this year, and Stanford has not been good the last few years. Is this the year David Shaw listens? The word I got back was, nah, probably not. But for the first time, it wasn't a slam dunk. No. Pat Fitzgerald in Northwestern, who you guys didn't mention, who might be the number one college candidate right now. He's got kids that are both, I think, in high school at the moment. I think the word I got was that he's going to wait until they're out of high school before he leaps. But like when the Bears had, or the Packers had the vacancy two years ago and they hired LaFleur, I was told straight up, no, like he will not leave Northwestern. He's got a great situation there. So I think things are opening him up. Matt Campbell. Not sure. Harbaugh, I don't know if there's a market for Harbaugh right now after the season Michigan's had. And the third name was Dabo Sweeney. I don't think he's leaving or Lincoln Riley. Urban, How about your coworker, Urban Meyer? Urban's fascinating. Urban's fascinating. He's been out of this for a while. Um, you know, you've been hearing the Chargers for a couple years now. And, there was, and then mm. recently Jacksonville's been coming up a bunch. He's got a very good situation at Fox. I know he's very happy there. They love him and they they believe their show is up there, if not better than the one on ESPN. So like urban is a huge key cog to that. And he's got a long future with them. Question is the Shad Khan, or in this case, the Spanos family or one of these teams, or even the jets hand him the keys and say, you're the personnel guy. You're the coach. You hire whoever you want. You've got unlimited budget. Go for it. And does it tickle urban enough to say, I got to get one more shot at this. I think Trevor Lawrence might play a bigger role than any of these guys, um, as far as the owners and everything, like maybe Urban is tempted by that and saying, "All right, Shad Khan, here's an unlimited check. Here's the freedom to bring in my own staff, and I get the first overall pick. That might excite me." Mm. But I will tell you, he is happy at Fox, and they love him over there. I I don't know if Fox can pay him what the Jacksonville Jaguars or the Jets or the Chargers can, but it's a much easier life for Urban Meyer doing those Saturday hits and giving pep talks into a computer screen. Um, Being your coworker, I think that's a huge plus. So That's a great, I mean, that's probably the biggest us. perk of all. Yeah. Is there any uh, coaches uh, that are back to kind of the recycled ranks yeah. um, in the NFL, a Jim Caldwell, a Bill Cower, even any of these guys uh, that might pop up and have a serious chance to get a job? <laughs> the one name, and, you know, I thought maybe Bill O'Brien would get another look. I haven't heard much on him. Marvin Lewis apparently has a lot more mm. love in the league than, than – Has he already interviewed with Houston? Was that right? I believe he did. I believe Ian yeah. and Mike reported that this weekend. Um, and it's not just a, hey, Marvin Lewis deserves an interview. He's been a coach for like – Well, Marvin Things Lewis are beginning to reveal themselves that, gosh, Marvin Lewis took that team to the playoffs with that limited st uh, budget, scouting staff, and some of the things that plague – the Bengals historically to the playoffs five years in a row and built a winner. And yeah, they didn't win games, but like there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this season. And I think having a, a leader of men and that's such a, I roll my eyes because I think all these guys are leaders of men. They wouldn't be getting where they are and what they weren't, but like an, an authoritative voice with someone with the skins on the wall. Some of these teams after what has been going on over the last 18 months might say, let's just hand over the keys to Marvin because he can only, he not only mm. coach football, but that's an adult in the room. Right, and he can hire a good staff. A I lot mean, of who's going to be excited about that, though? No I one. With all due respect to Marvin Lewis, Fair. no one, no one. And yeah, I and I feel like equation. it's an uphill battle. But you look around the league and you see a lot of his assistants, you know, with coaching jobs, and that that's that's part of it too. That he he like has this long rolodex. You mentioned the thing about Fox's college show is maybe better than ESPN. You know, you work for Fox, and and it has gotten a lot of bu buzz this year. Though, and Reggie Bush is part of that show, and it just occurred to me: how much do you think that show doing well? Um, is directly related to the lessons Reggie Bush uh, learned while he did our digital show last year, the Around the NFL type digital that show. Question. question, yeah. I that think those I think those moments were memorable, and I think you know when he was lulling the the opportunity to leave NFL Network and uh, to go to do Fox's Thursday night NFL coverage and their Saturday um, football main show. I think it was it was probably a difficult decision for him, um, yeah. but he certainly he certainly learned a lot from from you guys. For sure. I mean, the intriguing aspect of that is he said goodbye to none of us. Um, yeah, but yeah. I just I think there was a lot of one day. Just wasn't 
He was like one day he just wasn't there for the show, but that wasn't totally out of character. So it was like we didn't even know that he was out of the company. I, I guess it is a little weird for us to be expecting a, a dear John letter from Reggie Bush. Uh, two two more things uh, from me uh, before we say goodbye. And boys, feel free to chime. I want to go through my list though. I want to go through my names for you. Oh, guys. you got Let's more. Get... Let's oh, hear yeah. more. Let's Come hear on. <laughs> Let me rattle them off for you because here's what I've got. I, I honestly, this is my favorite thing to do as opposed in addition to the draft is get the gossip on the coaching stuff, because I feel like I'm as plugged in as anybody with this stuff. And I talk to all the teams and a lot of the agents of the yes, coaching Rager. and it's pound your chest. I'm pounding my chest, but it's, this is like the one niche. Like I don't do injuries. Well, I don't do free agent signings that well, I, but like the coaching stuff, I love the machinations behind it. And I talk to all the presidents and GMs and you know, it's going to be really interesting. So I want to go through some of the names and some of the processes that are at stake here, because I think this is the most unique year that there is no slam dunk candidate. Like mm. I don't see that Josh, Mc, Josh McDaniels in recent years when they're coming off another thing, you know, playoff thing. It's like, Oh, McDaniels is the hot name or Kyle Shanahan took this team to the Super Bowl. Like the enemy, is he the hot name? I feel like he was around last year and I was going to get another opportunity. And I do believe he will get one of these jobs, but I don't see teams jumping up and down or fan bases jumping up and down saying, gosh, even as good as they've been, I just don't feel the buzz around the enemy this year as I did last year. I think Eric's going to be a, a premier candidate. I think Robert Sala, the defensive coordinator for the 49ers, everyone is linking him to Detroit because he's got Detroit connections and he went to Michigan state or he, he got a graduate degree from Michigan state and he grew up two miles from the lions facility and both his parents still live in that town which is, I believe, Deerfield, Michigan. So there's a lot of like local roots there. Mm -hmm. But I think Sala could get some offers from other teams, and then it's his decision what he wants to do. So Sala, Biennemi are two big names. Dayball up in Sala, Buffalo Sala. is a big name. Arthur Smith, the offensive coordinator for the Titans, is getting a lot of buzz right now. And those are like the main guys. And I don't know mm. if any fan base – is doing flip like if you're a Jets fan, are you like, oh my God, we have a chance to get Arthur Smith? Nothing against Arthur Smith, but like it doesn't feel like there's that home run. And I don't even know if Urban Meyer does it for fans. He's like Urban Meyer's many years removed from college football, let alone never done it in the pros. Like, I don't know if there's that home run pick that everyone is like, oh, we got the guy. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's that the the high sex appeal guy. I don't know if that if that really it makes sense. Like if Dennis sense, Allen but... is the head coach of say the chargers next year, like our chargers fans, like, Oh my God, let's go. The Dennis Allen era. You know what I mean? Like I, there's nothing against these you guys. Think Dennis so, Allen could get hired. Dennis Allen could get hired. Defensive coordinator of the saints. Mm -hmm. They had a great year this year. But yeah, look at like Sean experience. McDermott and the bills last year. I think a lot of people thought that was a solid hire when it happened. And now you look at it four years later and it's like, Oh my God, what, what a home run. So I right. think if you're, if your team is looking for a head coach, don't give up hope because there isn't that slam dunk guy. And I, maybe I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to the yeah, audience. Right I'll give you a name. I'll give you a name because, Dan, I know you're invested in one team um, specifically. And I think they're going to be a really interesting situation. They probably don't have Trevor Lawrence. Let's just assume they don't. So there's not that giant carrot there. Um, they've had years of, you know, just unsuccessful, no playoffs, ineptitude if you want, whatever it is. There's a name like Wink Martindale, the defensive coordinator of the Ravens, who's in his 60s or late 50s, but is like a super high energy, beloved guy. Like, does that get you? Like, I don't know what the Jets fan even wants at this point. Yeah, uh, that no, I, like Wink Martindale, uh, that would be a shrug your shoulders hire. Uh, Marvin Lewis would be a panic hire. Uh, at least the fan base would look at it that way. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any Jim Harbaugh. Like, there are, as you know, uh, Pete. The, the Johnson family has danced around Jim in the past, and I just wonder if they're going to want to make a splash higher and, and go after Harbaugh. And that, I feel like, has a, a, a boom-bust reward at a high level. Yeah, the uh, the wild card, like, dazzling, like, ooh, higher might be if someone was to actually bring in Joe Brady, who's 30 years old. Um, but I don't think the Panthers mm. did enough for me to be like, yes, mm. that's the guy. You know, like – and then the other one is uh, the defensive coordinator out in Los Angeles, Brandon Staley, who's 38. He's not 30, but last year he was an outside linebackers coach. And now you're saying, okay, well, he ran the best defense in the league with the Rams. Right. I, it, it's such an interesting year. And we didn't even start talking about the GMs, which. Well, I want to, yeah. Tell me about Riddick, if nothing else. Like how, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated that 
and they didn't mention it once on the broadcast, no. even when the teams come up. I, hey, you got to mention it. We, we had Joey on today. We asked him. We we're like, Scott, you interviewed for the Lions job. What was it like? Like, you have to ask. Right. Uh, what do you? He he's interviewed for at least two jobs. Was it three? I don't know. Um, you think he has a legit shot to get one of these? Yes, it was an interesting deal this year because they're doing it over Zoom. So, like, you know, you mm. come in and you're sitting on a Zoom for several hours, and you know, take the Detroit one for example. He's got the owner in one box, he's got Chris Spielman in another box, and he's like, you know, it's tough. Like, it's on Zoom, or you're really good at presenting over Zoom, and you can do it, and you've had <laughs> practice at it. So weird. It's really weird, and it's you know, it's a difference between being in in some guys' cases making six figures to making you know mid seven figures in some of these GM positions. So it's a huge life opportunity and a huge, huge leap for some of these GM candidates back to Riddick though. I've heard he interviewed really well at a couple places. Um, I think he's got a good shot this year. There's going to be six, seven openings. I think he's got a good shot this year. Um, and it's as good a shot he's had this year than he's had in any of the years pr prior. How long mm. till Daniel Jeremiah is a general manager? I mean, his <laughs> name's been th thrown around here and there. I mean, is it, Look, is he, it seems like star rising on that front. You laugh. I mean, absolutely. If DJ wanted one of these jobs, he would be a top candidate because he exemplifies it every day and he lives and breathes it. And he's actually plugged into the NFL. He's more than just a guy who does the draft. The fact he does those chargers games might seem like a nothing Sunday thing, but like he sees the league, he sees the league in person. Like he gets it. And He's got a great track record. If Daniel wanted to leave the NFL network to do that, I think there would be a lot of teams willing to listen. So far, all the things that I've heard, and he actually came out last year, I think, and was like, I'm staying. No, like, There's been rumors, but I'm staying. I think it was to be an assistant to Joe Douglas in the Jets. That's when he came out and said that. Um, I, I think he's made it pretty clear. He's happy with where he is at the moment. At the very least, he should leverage all this knowledge into starting a podcast or something. I think he would right. do pretty well. I think that would be a good he ever yeah. tried that. that hey, uh, any other names you want to throw out there, Pete, yeah. before bringing in for a landing here? Yeah, GM is going to be really interesting. And the team I would circle um, that could be fascinating for, for this group specifically, you know, for years, the GM position is the best scout in the building or the best player personnel guy or the guy who – just, you know, grinds on the college tape. There was no real traveling for college football for any the of these. Pastor, the pastor. Yeah. You got to get him in there. <laughs> yeah, no. But um, he's not the GM, by the way. He's I, not. He's no, not. He, yeah, I so actually, yeah. I, I actually want to do a great defense of Jack Easterby. I feel like someone Ooh. brought his name up and, and Sorry, I just shouldn't got, have interrupted you. <laughs> he just got buried by everybody. And it was like, poor Easterby. I don't know him at all. I don't even know. Uh, I never met him personally, but it's like, you found your whipping boy media and it's like all right let's go um well, right at sessler the, that, you know have you been, no, have you been told, behind that i was told by someone in our company to stop discussing him so <laughs> i've been silenced so he you know there is someone somewhere sensitive about it yeah i'm not sure i mean I, that guy the, 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 whatever um i would look i don't know i would look to the carolina panthers and just the way tepper does business you mentioned him mm. I don't think you're going to get a run in the mill hire. And if you do, it's because that run in the mill hire. And I don't mean to dismiss whoever they end up do hiring. Um, if it is because he impressed Tepper and blew him away in the interview, I just think the way David Tepper does business and I've gotten to know him fairly well, not, we haven't talked about like the general manager position or anything, but like he views this as, as, as a competitive environment where he is, I don't want to, he's a killer. I mean, he's a killer on wall street. This is a guy who looks at things and says, how's everyone else doing it? How can I be a disruptor? How can I be asymmetric? I'm going to get it done with the rule hire. Everyone thought he was going to the giants. He's like, he's not leaving the house that he lives in. If I get there first and he didn't, he paid him the most and convinced him to bring all his staff and he have it. The GM hire is not going to be, all right, here's the best player personnel guy. The GM hire for the Carolina Panthers is going to be very well vetted and is going to have to earn that position. And I wouldn't be shocked if they did something that is a little bit spin this league on its head because mm. new CBA, lower salary cap, the draft, is, the draft is a crapshoot anyway. And this guy, he's, He's not doing this because his family's family's family has passed this on to him and he doesn't want to upset the fan base. He's already fired Ron Rivera and cut Cam Newton. I, I think the Panthers fans are like, whatever this guy does, I guess at the time being, we'll have to believe in it. And so far, I think the Matt Rule hire was the right call. So I'm fascinated. This is the first non-football you know, coach 
hire for for David Tepper, and I'm really interested to see who he picks to run this organization as far as rosters go. Mm, awesome uh, insight, as always, from the great Peter Schrager. And uh, before you go, Pete, uh, it was about 18 months ago, I'm going to say, that you made – I think it was your first appearance on the show, uh, but the first one where we were all together, the Poolside Pod That's great. Uh, at the NFL Media Talent Summit. Has anything changed on this front? You can keep it to one word. When you look <laughs> around the circle here at the four of us, which one do you respect the most? Greg. Which one do you respect the most? Which one do you respect the most? Greg. 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 Uh, I love all you guys equally. I love Wes. I love I love uh, Ricky Hollywood. I love all you guys equally. You're all you're all equal to me. Only one of you though was on the weakest link that I happened to be fu- didn't even know was happening. Was watching the television, showed up, and then a day later, it's like <laughs> here's Mina Kimes winning someone a million bucks. I'm like, yeah, I don't enough. Mina Kimes needs more love. Let's give Erica some love here. She was on a, a, a actual show and was great. Thanks, Pete. That means you know? means a lot. You got a supreme, like, you got a supreme hoodie on. You're like, you got swag. Like, yeah, love you, bro. Yeah, you got, That's good. got you. you know, Pete. I'm glad you said that because yeah. it wasn't just that Mina, who who's great. Uh, it wasn't just that she um, was on a sh- another game show. She was responsible for the million dollar winner, and then poor Ricky <laughs> Hollywood. She's doing her best. She gets savaged by I thought unfair questions, allowing the worst player in their history, the weakest link to be victorious. It just, it just, it didn't feel fair ultimately for Ricky. And it's like Jane Lynch was not all that warm or nice. Like there was a lot of things that I had problems with. Um, Mina Kimes helping out millions of small restaurants and maybe keeping hundreds of small businesses alive. That might be for some people. (laughs) I, that might be some people's thing. I was more into the weakest link and, uh, what we saw from our friend who works on this show. Awesome. Understandable. (laughs) You did it, Pete. Thank you for uh, giving us your time. You're a very busy man. And congratulations. Every Thursday night football telecast this year, Troy Aikman singing your praises of both you and the entire show. That is a thrill as well. Can I I make a request for tomorrow when you're on Good Morning Football? And this might be like, can I get a can I get an album cover from you? Can I request one? Uh, if I have it. I you You have to have it. Okay. I was going to request the cars, Rico Kersick and the boys. Mm. From, if you Let have me, anything from the cars. Okay. Maybe not tomorrow, but I am absolutely going to work on that. Let me know which album you're thinking of as well. Okay. I can go Take with Rush. Rush works How too. About you Bob, could you replace it with um, the Hanson brothers? Hanson, Hanson's great. <laughs> yes. Middle, uh, middle of nowhere. I middle of nowhere, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Great song. All right. Good Excellent. stuff. Great Peter Schrager, you're the Thanks, man. Guys. Thank you, buddy. Oh, there he goes. Schrager bomb. Great guest. He's one of our best guests because Pete here, I think we, you know, we'll get 10, 12 minutes with Peter. He wants to dig in. He wants to go deeper. I try to bring it in for a landing and he said, Oh no, no, no. I got a lot more to get to. And uh, I feel like we're all smarter and more prepared for black Monday as a result. Yeah. I also thought that it's, it's pretty clear that I'm not going to say that Greg has lost um, esteem in, in Peter's eyes, but the rest of us, um, have clearly been raised up to some degree. He, I thought his answer that he respects us equally uh, was honest and um, well, peaceful when he waters. Gave an, it's when he gave an actually honest answer before he, he's gotten in trouble for it. He's gotten grief. You guys couldn't Well, it's 18 it. months ago. The world was a totally different place. <laughs> it would be easier to respect Greg 18 months ago. Things have changed. <laughs> you know, it is. There are parallels to the Chiefs and the Bills. Greg's the Chiefs with Schrager and who he respects. But here we are just firing up the power rankings, and now the, the gap has been narrowed, it seems, and perhaps uh, Greg will get overtaken. Just keep an eye on it. Uh, All right. All right. Things have changed since we were poolside at that villa. In well, Santa that's Monica. for sure. That's for sure. Um, all right. I let's also, get to after it. that day, had like 35 days off. Um, mm. I run by there fairly often and, and do think of that moment where Schrager was wrapping a towel around the microphone that he was holding. That's, if we ever did an unsolved mystery uh, on you know with this show, I want it to be about Schrager wrapping the microphone with the towel. I remember after it ended, I said, Erica, what? Why? What was happening with that? And uh, it was just a, a total mystery. Total mystery. All right. Here we go. I'm excited. You know, I'm excited. I love power rankings. I love ranking things. I love uh, when Greg gets passionate about the booth and who he likes and who he doesn't like. It's a major topic uh, offline. 
uh, on text and in conversation. And, uh, you know, Sessler, you know, he's he's got his sardonic wit. And when you could weaponize that into a listicle, excited me. I'm just going to – I just made a tactical decision here not to have my own list. Uh, I don't have to worry about anybody coming up to me at a coach's breakfast. I prefer to sit back and just watch the inferno. Some men just want to watch the world burn. (laughs) It's not an inferno. I see what you've done here. No, in all seriousness, this is all done with respect. We're not trying to destroy people here, Of course. Right. Right. Well, that's the thing. The other week we're arguing about, you know, the – the booth and I'm thinking about play by play. And it's part of that. It was more talking about like, this is the hardest job in sports being play by play guy. I think on an NFL game or play by play in general, but you know, NFL is our area. I'm totally with you. I'm to- in fact, yeah. we are, I guess on some level, quote unquote broadcasters. We talk into a mic for a living and I marvel at how these guys do it. The play by play dudes, the, be, the, just the recall to know who, just fell down in pursuit on the defensive line, who came out of nowhere to make the tackle, which slot receiver, or wait a second, was that the guy on the outside who came across the middle and made that catch? The the guys that are really good, the way they can do it without missing a beat is something that uh, is easy I mean, to I, admire. I would be in a nervous panic. I love football <laughs> a whole bunch, but if it was like, we've got a thorny, like rough situation with 18 <laughs> seconds left to go and people all over, I would run out of the booth and I would run to my car and drive home. I'd love, I'd love to see Seth do mom. it. So yeah, we're, we're like, understa- we're understanding that. And, but then again, you think about it and you're like, well, you're stepping into the arena and these guys are, are talking about who's a better quarterback who's a better wide receiver. They're criticizing um, the head coach at times. Maybe that's you're not right. the play-by-play guy as much, but it's like if you're going to step into the arena, you you got to – it's a high standard. And we, we were arguing in particular, you know, about Monday night, and, I, and, I would, and I've got my, you know, opinions. And I thought, well, it would only be fair, you know, if you're going to say this, like, all right, let's actually rank them. Let's, mm-hmm. let's make a list of the play-by-play guys. And we watch a lot of Game Pass, or you do it on Shortcuts, I know, Mark. And so it's like, I'm hearing these guys every week. And so you, you form opinions. And I decided, okay, I'll put say? it on paper. About 50. I just looked who were the 15 play-by-play guys the previous weekend. And I just, you know, put them down one to 15 for my, for myself. I did not think this is going to be a, uh, you know, a pod bit, but I just wanted to see how I, how it shook up. It's I think it makes for good conversation. And if it makes for good conversation, then why not say it on the show? And I don't understand why you need to take a shot at Mark there and say you take shortcuts. That, I mean, this guy, he puts in the work. You can hear it when he analyzes football. <laughs> it's called it's the direct TV shortcuts. <laughs> it is I a just product. know that Mark prefers that over the Game Pass version. Well, we could get into that another time. I will no. not belabor it, but they, they, yeah. they do something that Game Pass editors have chosen not to do okay. often. Let's put it no that way. Who cares? That's okay, not, here we go. That's too All far right. down. Let's right. start with the play-by-play guys. Then we're going to okay. move to the Sessler list. And how do you want to do it, Greg? Maybe it'd be better to start with the – when. so this you're essentially basing this off week 16, who we saw, who we heard. Yeah. Um, uh, want to start at the bottom of the list or make our way up? Um, no, let's start at the top. I don't know because I don't want to like – No, bo- see, you heard Schrager being diplomatic on the last segment. And no. you're like, wait a second. I need no. to be that way too because the top is myself. the top's more interesting to me. And frankly, more people are going to know oh. who, who we're talking about there or have opinions. And and after the top six or so, there was a lot of blending blending in. But I, okay. I, had, I had to go Joe Buck number one. Mike Absolutely. Tirico, number two, and Kevin Harlan, three. Uh, Al Michaels, four. Slow Ian down, slow down, Eagle. Slow down. Wait, slow I'm just going to – I want to break. This is the top tier. Okay. okay. Ian Eagle, five, and Nance, six. And to me, those are the big six. And I've got – you know, they're all great. And you could argue any one of them should be higher or lower. Uh, all right. But that, that was my sixth. Hit me that again. You got Buck, one. Yeah. Tirico would be one if he had Tirico. more starts. But availability – you know, it's not his fault. Um, but availability is is a trait here, and he's not giving me. Um, he's not out there enough. I'm getting Buck twice a week. I'm getting Tariko, you know, a handful of times every year. So he would have been one because he's got the. He does the things that bother me the most in the ones that are towards the bottom of the list. Tariko, a command mm-hmm. of the rules. A command of the rules is very important to me. And you don't uh, think Tariko has that as much? No, I think he does. I think oh, he's number he one. That's what I'm saying. Is like the command of the rules. A command of the players and the coaches, the personnel, like knowing everything and being able to paint that picture. And of course, all these guys at the top have a sense of the moment, 
you know, they have, they have a sense of what matters and painting the picture and all that stuff. But that's where Tariko is amazing. But yeah, Joe, Joe Buck and Troy, I think they'd be my number one group right now. Yeah, so you got Bucket number one, which is, I think, hard to deny. Five years ago even, I feel like there'd be a lot of pushback on that because people didn't always like Buck and thought he maybe come off came off as a little smug. Um, but I think there has been a general greater appreciation for him. I have no problem with that. Tariko, too. We, we love Tariko on the show. Harlan I like a lot, uh, not just because he's a pro and he's been on our show and he's a great dude, but to be able to do TV and radio and do it as well as he does, that's that's something. What do you think, Mark? Um, I'm in a, I mean, my list is very close to Greg's with one major alteration. Oh, no, I was asking because I want to hear more about No, no, Greg's I'm talking about play-by-play. Play. I'm talking yes, about Greg's list. My my play, my play number one play-by-play play play guy is Kevin Harlan. Ooh, okay. I, I put Harlan like squarely number one for me because I think because number one, you mentioned it, doing I radio. Doing color guys. I, I was just counting. I'm guys. counting TV, but that's fair. I mean, I you could you could tell me, Harlan is maybe more fun than anyone else. I did rank color guys, but I have an opinion on play by. Are you asking for that, or <laughs> no, are you? So, a, I ask. Okay, I what, I do want to hear your opinion on everything, Mark. But are you saying that you made a list for play by play guys? I you, did on my own, but I did the co- the presentation the list part of, of this record, will be the color the, list, the color commentators. <laughs> the list of record for today's podcast is Greg's play by play your color. So I sure. just don't, I want the segment to be able to be clear and concise to the listener. If you also have a play by play list, I just need to know that as host and then I'll I, adapt that way. I am simply saying that I thought Greg's list was pristine minus one change that I would okay, make. You'd put Harlan turns stuff. Well, we've, yeah. we've, okay. ble- we've blown past concise. Um, and uh, look, Al's an all time. Great. Uh, he's in an interesting spot with another all time great in the same building as uh, Tariko. So he, you know, I still love listening to Al- I and Eagle, very underrated. And Nance, like, you know, it's not my like favorite flavor of tea. You know, you got your different flavors, but not but, a vineyard, uh, vineyard, but yards top, man, whatever. But top shelf, you know, a quality. You feel like you're watching a big game. You spent a lot of time with him. It's all good. Mm-hmm. That's why Al Michaels for me is still. Um, number one, even though he is up there in age, I haven't seen a, a slippage that maybe you guys see. And when I hear Al Michaels on the mic, and this goes back to being a man of a certain age now, it's like, okay, this is good. That's why I love, you know, even though we're at the games, uh, not a humble brag, just the truth. Uh, so we're not hearing the Super Bowl telecasts like most people. Like, if I know that Al, Chris, and Michelle are on the game, it's like, oh, that's the number one Super Bowl mm. team I want. Uh, but opinions vary, obviously, with Al at, at this state of his career. And he and he loves it. He lo- I think he loves all sports, but that is that's a big part of so, sort of separating out this top tier. Like Harlan, you can just Harlan, you can just tell loves sports. That goes mm-hmm. along long with me. Tariko, beneath all the intelligence and like knowledge, you can tell how much he loves it. He's just like a sports junkie. Totally. All right, what, let's see the bottom half of, of what I mean, you want to share with us, Greg, and then I want to hear uh, Mark's uh, color guys list. All right, I'm just going to I'm gonna go go through it. The, this middle tier is, you know, <laughs> it's hard to separate them all, but I'm going, the next I'm going Kenny Albert, Kevin Kugler, uh, Amin on, um, Adam Amin on Fox, all really good. Joe Davis is good. Andrew Catalan, we're getting to Steve Levy, Monday Night, Spiroditas, Greg Gumbles, and Chris Myers rounds out the list right there. I uh, See, that. I got it out of you. That's good. So you got Myers buried in last place. You got Steve Levy way too low. Steve should be higher, in my opinion. The rising star for me is Kevin Kugler. I, I thought he did great work uh, this past week. I, I, I texted you guys about it. He was as sharp, sharp as a tack. In fact, that was when I was just saying why I admire good play by play so much. I was, I was really impressed by how quick he was uh, and being spot on every time there was um, a play happening or a skirmish or a guy missed a tackle. He knew every t- time in the moment who it was. Uh, Kugler, rising star for me. Your mm. thoughts, Sessler? Um, I, I'm very... I on think Greg's Greg, list. No, Greg and I have talked about <laughs> um, these things so much that I have some shared... Um, I have shared feelings about who's near the bottom. And I think the lack of, there are people that are into football and there are some that I think are just play by play people on a contract. And, and there is a difference between these types. Uh, I have no argument. I would put Steve Levy a little bit higher because I thought, you know, put into a challenging position, 
He's gotten better, um, but I wouldn't put him a lot higher. I, I think that your your list is is cool with me. Well, here's the thing. Yeah, a lot of the other guys are play-by-play guys for everything. You know, that's what they've been doing their whole life. That's what they've been trained to do. And there, are, I think, are some technical parts of the job that it has to do with rules and and knowing the player and everything. It's a that's like part of your that, mind. That some guys you know? like Joe Davis, who's getting a lot of pop at, at Fox as the MLB uh, number two guy behind Joe Duck. He's def- uh, Joe Buck. He's definitely a rising star at Fox. Can just slide into football, which is maybe not even his main sport, and they just like they got a handle on it. You know, they got a handle mm-hmm. on it. I, yeah, I, I like him a lot. I think he's got a lot of ability. And, and Greg, maybe you will tell us at some point. What happened with you and Steve Levy? Maybe it goes back to your PFT. Was there something you wrote at PFT that has created this issue? (laughs) It feels personal. It feels like a little score settling. Some men just want to watch the world. It's not. It's respect for all these other guys doing it. And that he's in a big, that's where I'm talking about the spotlight. It's, you know, he's on that Monday night football game. And so, uh, you know the rule. The rules. I keep ham- hammering that. Like the situation, the two minute, like prompt your guy to talk about the like this fourth down call uh, that's coming up instead of like with three seconds before it happens. Be like, oh, and they're going for it on fourth. You know, those are the little things that I notice okay. personally. All right, that's fair. Let's now move to the color side of things. Mark, uh, give us. A, let's start with your top three. Give us your top three. My top three, and I think that this job is a little bit different, obviously, than play-by-play, and I don't think there are as many good ones. I'll start there. But um, top three, Troy Aikman. Uh, second to Troy Aikman, Tony Romo. Chris Collinsworth, number three for me. Mm. Okay. This is, a good, this is a good start because right off the bat, I knew you would have Troy first. I know you love Aikman. Um, I think Romo is the best personally, but Aikman is very close to 1B. So I, I, I'm cool with your list. And Collinsworth, geez, I love Collinsworth too. Just going back to my original thoughts about it's a big game when Al and Chris are behind the mic, but I, I can't really quibble too much with your list. That's a nice start. No, I'm with, just... I'm with you too. And I think Aikman is uh, – Tony Romo's my like – he's my Patrick Mahomes where he's, he is the best. But for this season, this is like Troy Aikman's – you know, Rich Gannon MVP year, or yeah, I should think of someone even better than that. You know, like uh, Russell Wilson. Troy Aikman's Troy Aikman nev- year, in right? Like Ninety two. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> like, uh, like I take my, I take Romo to build the franchise, but I think Aikman is the MVP this year. What a year! All right, so that that feels like Mark the clear like top three guys. Who's in the uh, Who's in that middle tier? For me, I I go number four. I had Charles Davis. Um, there's something that I really like about Charles Davis. I think that he has, um, he kind of knows where every player went to high school and college, has a lot of added extra, um, I think, information that other guys don't. I think he's technically good. I think he's good observations. And I, you know, we know him personally, and I think he's, he's someone that puts in a ton of work. So I, and for me, that's four. This thing gets messy for me because I don't have a, like a huge um, fascination in some of these other guys, but this guy's barely appeared. But I think Nate Burleson, could be better Mm. than almost anyone on this list based on the few games I've seen him do. Um, I had him as like a potential number five. I go in, Dan, this is, I'm not doing this to serve you um, at number six, a dish that you will like, but I think Brian Greasy has improved over the course of the season tremendously. And there's something else that that three man booth is not, I don't think three man booths really work. I think that they keep trying to recreate magic from the past and I think it drowns out Lewis Riddick a little bit, who I think could be great if the table is set for him. Um, he may be not a booth guy as much, but Greasy has worked really hard to build chemistry in that booth. And I think he's shaken off a little bit of his inability to critique. Last night, I thought he critiqued. Um, you know, in the last couple of games, he's been a little, little bit of a heavier hammer on things, which mm. I needed from him. Mm. Mark, I, yeah, I think Greasy's had a, a, a nice season. Overall, I, I thought, he, you know, I think he speaks with confidence and I, I was admiring his work yesterday as well. I think he's good. Um, I think Moose Johnson is still should be in that second tier. I kind of like the Moose. What I think Burkhardt and Moose with Pam Oliver is a really solid team. I think he should be in that. Tier. He's you know, next this, on my list. This is reminding me of Dr. Z, Paul Zimmerman. Uh, used to do a, a yearly rankings of all the broadcast teams. 
and like they all hated him because of it basically <laughs> <laughs> like you know i mean the ones that he liked like he always was big on ron pitts so like ron pitts loved him um but like yeah he, he would like he would give them like zero out of five stars and, and, <laughs> and pretty odd i think he hated the early like buck and aikman like he would bury them with like one star i mean that's what i want to get to it as i keep getting um keep getting older is is really not care uh, when these people hate you because they because everyone cares they don't there isn't right, a lot of criticism of these guys because everyone's like not criticism but there's not a lot of ranking of these guys because everyone works with them and you, know, you, you don't want to deal with but it. you know what greg i think one way to look at it is like we take criticism too not on sure. the scale of these guys but on social media and sure. things of that nature i mean what we do for a living so I, but i will say that trent green having trent green and rich gannon in our lives feels duplicative Oh, mm. I think I'm going to, you know, Gannon is much higher for me. I think Gannon's fine. I kind of like Gannon, Rich Gannon. He's, he's fine. Some men just want to watch. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? Anybody else you want to talk about? Is there well, somebody that you really don't need to hear? You don't want on a Browns game? Let I will say the next little quick tier was Daryl Johnston, Rich Gannon. Um, and for me, it moves into, uh, you know, for me, it's it's like I need to feel the chemistry between the play-by-play and the color commentator. And in a lot of the lower groupings, to me, are just the early slate mm. games that don't um, change my feeling one way or the other. I, 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 James Loft and Trent Green are probably rounding out my list. I'm sure they put in a ton of work. I think that part of describing football, what we've learned through some of these teams, is just because you played, um, the ability to communicate what is happening – um, and, and to teach fans who are savvier than ever um, is a skill. And I think some of the guys that are lower on the list, they're developing these skills. But um, you can't – I don't know. I just feel like there's there's some of these people mm. that feel a little folksy, a little basic, and um, I Put need to be delighted. Put huh? names on it. I said I think – I think like he the, said who's he was folksy? Ra- he said he was I, rounding I out his the, list. He I said mentioned he was the rad- bottom of my list. Like I yeah. like. You know, Mark Schlereth, James Loft, and Trent Green. I, they know mm. more than I do about football, but um, I'm not learning from them the same way on Sundays. And, and I don't need to know that on third and 11, you need 12 yards. I, I, that part I get. Well, that, you know, that that's really, um, yeah, it's well said. Just saying things that, like, are, are, are but that's, it's just, their person you know sometimes it's just their personality it's one right. it's one reason why i love the vilma jonathan vilma and kenny albert booth jonathan vilma like he's not as technically polished i think it was his first full year but he loves it and he loves defensive football in such a way that most of the color guys i think are offensive and it's almost all he talks about is defense and he's just so fired up and is so excited when things happen that that carries me i love that booth i love the charles davis and ian eagle booth and that's kind of the that's maybe one of the problems and it's unfair but it's like monday night football you're on an island and stuff if i'm thinking of that other networks have better uh, their number two booth is better than than your primetime booth, like an Iron Eagle Charles Davis booth, which is pristine. And then, then you know, then you get some criticism. I like that, like, four times a telecast, Jonathan Vilma says something that makes Kenny Albert deeply uncomfortable. Like, I give <laughs> bonus points for that. Like, he's a little loose with his lips, Jonathan Vilma, and he'll, yes. he'll say certain things that you don't hear. And I think that's good. Akib Tlaib, he, he is a guy that – uh, got a lot of uh, buzz both ways on social media. He's kind of a prospect to watch. And a little shout out to Kurt Warner, who does really good stuff. Oh my oh, god, radio. of course. That, uh, he would be when he Warner's top four. When Warner and Tarico are together, that's that's another one. I love Kurt Warner on games. He is one. And it's not because we work with him. I mean, he is so he is so. That's another one. It's like okay, put that one in prime. I, I kind of I kind of forgot about that because he's he's strictly radio. But um, I, it's funny to me because I think he shines absolutely shines on radio as a color commentator and then you put these guys on on sets to talk generally about games and it and it was a little bit less of Kurt Warner for me like he's so much better analyzing a game as it's happening it's a really special skill and you have to have the right personality and flair all right now again if anyone is listening to the show that is directly connected to today's analysis uh, it came from Greg Rosenthal and Mark Sessler, and you could reach out to them on Twitter. And also they are, once we get out of this pandemic, uh, they, they are at most of the 10 poll league events as well. As well. Feel free to uh, address any concerns. Mm. Uh, and ultimately small men compared to average. I mean, sure. especially, especially me. Especially you mean me. physically? Physically, yes. yes. No, yes. They may think it's the other way as well, based on <laughs> some of the shooting behind bulletproof glass, but... Listen, it's it's just part of the gig. 
Well, I don't need to be, you know, at the top of their podcast sidecar uh, rankings either. So can you tell the Greg, can you tell the story? Have we ever talked no, about the story? No, no, you've been weird. You are weird asking for it. a lot today, Dan, in terms yeah. of, you know, Greg and Mark burning every bridge surrounding them off the island. We can't talk about the breakfast story. You already have done enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Listen, I just had to ask. Like as a, as a journo, you know, when you want to get, you do not leave until that, the chamber is empty. That's for know? that's for our behind the music that we're gonna do <laughs> about the podcast in five years. Fair enough, I understand that. Okay, Erica, how you doing? <laughs> doing great. Erica, Erica, was... Erica could not be more bored of us uh, by us like breaking down the difference between that's Joe, some da- football Joe Davis right and there. Kevin Kugler. Care less. <laughs> that was like the football version you. of the Mandalorian. You're saying it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, you do say. Why do you say it weird? Are you doing intentionally? I guarantee it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Erica, do you have a favorite uh, play-by-play color team, or is? And I say this like not mocking her in any way, or do you just watch the game and not plug in on that way? Because that's the way most people are. Um, a little bit of both. I do like Tony Romo, um, and Nance, but I do think Kevin Harlan's the best. He's mm-hmm. awesome. And he was a great guest on the show. Exactly. He was so well. nice. Yeah. And remember, remember he said he'd sit in his hotel room like in Green Bay and blast NFL films music to get ready for that kind of that kind of stuff like I also think he's creative. He's not just a technical dude. Like he he'll go into these poem poems and poetics that no one else can do. So he's and a And he does basketball too. So That's right. Like he's like one of the he's a so... big And then radio and and yet you're Yet CBS is sometimes sticking him on like the fourth game. Come on, CBS. Well, he's out of position. He should be doing the best of the best. Very good. Very I mean, they, good. All they, right. it's an interesting who they paired him with, but I, I'll, I will stop speaking. <laughs> Aikman <laughs> bugs me. Oh, please. You don't like Aikman. Mm, I can, it's fine. Interesting. He's uncut yeah. this year. I think, I think it's partly because he's doing it twice a week. And they and he said something about they told him make the Thursday nights a little like more uh, punchy, a little more irreverent. And now you're traveling around during a pandemic. It's like I'm out here sweating for you, flying all over the country during a pandemic. What the f- I care if the special teams coach <laughs> doesn't like me? And he's just flying off the flying off the hip. You, off the you know, there has been moments this season where like Jera is yelling at a screen. What are you doing, Troy? I thought we had an understanding. <laughs> he was. He was burying Jared Goff uh, the other day, and to the point where Jared Goff's uh, had some, you know, people, media supporters being like, "Why is Choice? Why is Choice being so hard on him?" It's like, come He's on. A, him, it's funny those two guys, Goff and Wentz, who went at the top of their draft class together, are punching bags this year. Everybody getting their getting their chance to tee off on those two struggling QBs. Um, all right, well, they earned it, but just feels like there's been some extra zest in the criticism toward those two guys this year uh my opinion all right that's the only opinion i shared today i let everyone else handle the the heavy lifting i appreciate it boys um thank you again to peter schrager who's a stud watch him on good morning football five days a week and uh on fox where he does great work as well and we will be back on thursday when we will preview yes week 17 and that is the biggest preview episode of the year for us in terms of pure gameage because there will be 17, excuse me, six, 16 teams times two, 32. That's how many teams there are. There will be 16 games to preview on Sunday. So make sure you tune in for that. And Mark, as a little tease, yes. Dan, for that, obviously we've got some news around golf, but another star from the Rams placed on the COVID list that you're going to want to you know, hear about. Are you teasing that for Thursday show? You're teasing thir- yeah. like so don't check your phone. You probably know this if you're a big enough fan to listen to our show by now anyways. <laughs> I um, like but this don't idea, check your though. phone, don't check the news. There is a Rams star associated with a big star. Oh. Big star associated with third down that is I just uh, saw who it was. has now gone onto the COVID list. So right. just yep. just so, wait till Thursday to find out, okay guys? That's a that's an industry term known as a cliffhanger. You will find out which Rams star Went to the COVID list in two full days. All right, this is Dan Hansa signing off for Fight Storm. <laughs> the old boss, Ricky Hollywood, behind the virtual glass. Until Thursday. <laughs>